next speaker is uh, Steve Self. Um, Steve uh, came in 1981 to Hopkins. Uh, we could only keep him here for a few years. Uh, um, in 1984, he, he left and he joined the University of Washington. He's currently head of the program in biostatistics and biomathematics at the um, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Uh, he served as the executive director for the Statistical Center of HIV AIDS Research and Prevention uh, from 2004 to 2014. He's currently associate director of the Vaccine and Infectious Diseases Division of the, of the Hutch. Um, he's extremely active um, in the identification and evaluation of HIV vaccines. So if we have one, it's going to be in large part due to Steve's work. And, um, you know, Steve and, and um, Kung Yi have formed a, a real, uh, they've written a lot of papers together. And, and one of the must-reads that, um, that I tell my students and uh, that um, we, we always read is the self and Yang 19. 87 paper, um, which is the asymptotic properties under non-standard conditions. Non-standard comes back. <laughs> and so, um, Steve, uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen and Neijing, for organizing this. Uh, like the other speakers, it's something that I, I would not miss. Um, I guess I'd like to start with uh, kind of the obvious appreciation to Chuck of uh, hiring me. It was my first job uh, and um, letting me be a part of those first few years, even though it was only a short time. It was an exciting time and uh, I got to hang out with uh, some guys who have you know, become giants in the field and uh, that just doesn't happen um, um, all the time. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of, uh, of that. Looking at, uh, at uh, Kungi's slides, it reminded me of the many dinners that, uh, that we had at Chuck's house with Chuck and Sevilla sitting out there in the summer uh, outside with bottles of wine and, and uh, really uh, making us feel very welcome to, uh, to Baltimore. Um, however, uh, since I was only here for three years, um, you know, I, I can't speak the way others can to all of the things that Chuck has provided. Um, uh, over time, the, the, the mentoring, the sort of the long academic march, you know, under his leadership with the department and, and all of that. So um, uh, after I talk about my, um, uh, my topic here on polio eradication, I'll, I'll return to uh, an appreciation that uh, is much more uh, personal, I think, uh, but has been reflected in some of the comments that I've heard really from everybody, this, this quality that Chuck has of identifying um, when somebody needs something in a very quiet and unassuming way in my mind. So um, the last several years I've spent uh, really quite a lot of time working with the Gates Foundation on uh, vaccines for polio eradication. Um, it, uh, um, it is a, uh, a topic that I didn't expect to, uh, uh, to be working on but I'm really uh, gratified to be able to talk about it, particularly here at Hopkins, because polio uh, has the, uh, there's a chance for it to be the second infectious disease that will be globally eradicated, uh, with the first having, uh, it being smallpox, but the, that eradication effort uh, being really central, uh, uh, Hopkins being a real central driving force to that. So um, it was interesting last night at the banquet to see DA and, just brought all, uh, all this uh, importance of public health and disease eradication back. So I'm really quite happy to be able to talk about this. So um, we've done great uh, uh, in eliminating um, uh, polio from the world. Uh, here is a, uh, a slide that shows the uh, global case burden from uh, the, the last uh, uh, 25 years or so. Um, in 2000, um, uh, one of the three wild types, type two, was eradicated. And uh, we've got a second uh, uh, serotype, type three, that's on the ropes. Uh, the last case was reported uh, in late 2012. And the way these things work is if there goes three years without a reported case, then uh, it uh, can be certified by the WHO, which is sort of the, the blessing that, yes, we actually have uh, eradicated this. Now, the, uh, the main tool that's been used for this 
fantastic success thus far is the live attenuated Sabin oral polio vaccine, no PV. And it is a great vaccine. Uh, it's cheap to produce, it's easy to administer, you know, you just uh, uh, put some uh, drop in the mouth of an infant and, and, and they're immunized. Um, there are all three uh, serotypes in this vaccine and it generates high levels of antibodies to all three. Um, it also suppresses viral replication in the gut. So um, if uh, uh, after you're vaccinated and you're exposed, you're not shedding lots of virus, so your infectiousness is greatly, uh, is greatly reduced. So this contributes to this indirect effect that, that uh, uh, was mentioned uh, uh, by, uh, by Ron. Um, and moreover, the vaccine strain can be spread. It is shed through the stool and it can be, uh, uh, it's shed uh, peak is about seven days and, and tails off after about a month. And so others who have not been vaccinated could potentially be exposed and be at least partially immunized through, through that secondary exposure. So it's, it is just fantastic. However, what is great virtue in the early phase of eradication is not so, is not so great uh, now at, uh, at end game. So um, the genetic basis for the strain attenuation in, in Sabin, it's not perfectly stable. And so uh, this virtue of being able, uh, of being shed in the stool and exposing others actually uh, generates its own transmission outbreaks of vaccine derived poliovirus. Although it's not exactly the Sabin strain because uh, it's, uh, it's changing all the time. It's a, it's an enterovirus, it's a single strand RNA virus, which is pretty sloppy when it comes to replication. And so um, even in that week or a month of uh, replication in the gut and shed, it's, the, it's a different virus coming out. And in particular, um, the phenotypic reversion, um, uh, the, the neurovirulent phenotype can, can revert. And so there is a small fraction of cases, uh, very small in the early days of eradication, uh, that of uh, paralytic polio that is caused by revertant vaccine uh, viruses that have been shed and, and spread to others. So um, it's a problem. So th these are uh, recent data. This, uh, this is from WHO. They, uh, have really quite frequent updates of uh, surveillance. Uh, this is as of uh, April 14th, so it's data is less than a week old, and it's the trailing uh, 12 months. Uh, and uh, you can see where the, uh, uh, where the uh, wild uh, type uh, polio cases are arising. This didn't, uh, this didn't replicate that well on the slide, but there are about, uh, about 300 cases of wild type polio, all type one, uh, that have occurred in the, in the past uh, uh, 12 months. 96% um, of them are, are on this border uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. I'll talk about this later. Um, but there are also um, about 30 uh, cases associated with circulating vaccine strains. And so right now, uh, for every 10 cases of, uh, due to wild uh, virus, there's one case uh, due to vaccine strain. And as you can see, if we're going to uh, uh, eradicate wild virus, all of a sudden the problem is now uh, epidemics due to this uh, vaccine, uh, due to the vaccine itself. So that becomes the, the, the new problem to address. So what tools are available to address this problem? Well, there is uh, an inactivated uh, polio vaccine, uh, IPV. Uh, since it is inactivated, it doesn't replicate. There's no uh, vaccine strains that uh, circulate from it. And there's no uh, polio uh, uh, paralytic uh, cases uh, associated with it. Um, you deliver three doses and it produces uh, high levels of antibody, uh, uh, similar levels to, uh, to OPV. And uh, it is very similar to OPV in other ways. Um, and so that sounds great. However, it's much inferior to OPV in inducing gut immunity. So if you're IPV immunized and you get exposed to a live virus, be it vaccine strain or wild type, 
you shed that virus and all of, all of its uh, uh, descendants uh, through your gut um, uh, for a month. Uh, dynamics of uh, uh, the uh, uh, shedding are about the same as, uh, as an in unimmunized person. And so it doesn't deliver that reduction in infectiousness. Moreover, uh, maternal antibodies um, uh, reduce substantially the immune response to IPV. So while you can give uh, OPV uh, to newborns uh, and uh, have the vaccine take uh, very well in spite of the circulating maternal antibodies, you can't do the same with IPV. So you kind of have to wait until the maternal antibodies decay enough so that you can deliver the IPV and, uh, and you get a good immune response. This is a little dicey proposition because, you know, the kinetics of maternal antibodies are not uniform. And, waited too long, then there's this window where they're unprotected. Too soon, you immunize and it does no good. And so uh, that's a little tricky. Um, other kind of logistical issues, it, it's currently uh, administered by an injection, which is uh, a lot uh, trickier than just a, 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 an oral. And it's, it's a lot more costly to produce than, than OPV. So there's, there's some problems with IPV. So how to use this? Well, the uh, uh, endgame strategy uh, has identified the fact that uh, it's really serotype 2 that uh, of the three strains in OPV that is the least stable and the easiest to uh, convert to neurovirulence. And um, uh, types 1 and 3 are, are really pretty, pretty stable. And so there's an idea of uh, using a combination of bivalent OPV has just one and three, uh, combined with uh, IPV that would bring on uh, immunity to type two. And um, there are different ways that that could be worked, um, uh, but that's the, that, that's the general strategy. The, the plan, uh, the, the strategy and the timeline as it's been laid out is, um, uh, well, the last wild polio case, uh, wild type uh, case, uh, wild type uh, strain uh, polio case was supposed to be uh, 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 happen around uh, around now. Um, we haven't quite accomplished that yet. Uh, the main problem being uh, Pakistan, uh, although there are uh, isolated uh, cases in, in a number of other countries. And by mid-2016, there would be a global switch. So in 2016, on a designated day, OPV type 2 would be used nowhere. Uh, and then some uh, combination of uh, BOPV and, and IPV would be used uh, until um, uh, global certification, uh, three years after the last case. And uh, then BOPV would be, uh, would be ended and there would be an IPV only regimen. There are issues about uh, what happens uh, in outbreaks. Um, but that, that's the general plan. So this is what uh, uh, polio vaccine use uh, looks like, uh, well, as of last year. And you can see throughout uh, Asia, Africa, and in parts of Central and South America, uh, there's still use of trivalent OPV. And so these are the countries that have to change, and in 2016, the map will reflect that. So that's the plan. But the problem is how, you know, what are these, how to best use these vaccines. And so we come to uh, why uh, we're developing vaccines now uh, at the end game. So we want to protect infants from birth for all three serotypes. We want to eradicate the wild type viruses of all three. We want to eradicate the, the vaccine strains that are circulating. We want to stockpile vaccines that are tailored for outbreak control. And you can read into that some a vaccine that will control infectiousness, will control shedding in some way. And uh, we want to do all of this uh, at a low cost and you know, have it be logistically feasible to deliver. And so there are the can candidate vaccine strategies that are being evaluated. You start with BOPV in infants, and then you come a, uh, with uh, an IPV boost after the maternal antibodies, you know, have, have, have waned and timed that well. Or 
you start with IPV and uh, at a little bit later and you come with a POPV boost and uh, rely on maternal antibodies uh, beforehand. Um, there are um, candidate OPV vaccines, new NOPV vaccines that have genetic modifications to make them much more stable. And in some cases, in addition to that, uh, further attenuated with the Sabin strains. And so those are being developed and evaluated for outbreak control. And uh, then there are dose sparing with adjuvants and different regimens to, to work out. So that's the, those, are the, those are the various strategies. And so over the last three or four years, I've been designing trials. There are about 15 trials now that uh, have been designed, fielded, in, and we're analyzing data from, have been designed and in the field, or are we are actively designing now that will be done um, uh, over the next uh, three, or, three or four years uh, to address all of these things. The NOPV vaccines is an interesting problem because the natural uh, comparison to the new OPV is the Sabin, but particularly Sabin 2. But since there will be a global ban on the use of Sabin 2, and some of these NOPV trials won't be into the field until after mid-2016, we can't have a concurrent randomized control group for some of those trials. And so it's the first time that I've ever seen where we're designing prospectively a historical control. So those trials, the historical control uh, trials with uh, Sabin, uh, OPV2 will be going into the fields uh, shortly. Uh, there are different ages, uh, different environmental exposures, uh, depending on the local history of OPV used to, uh, to consider, uh, testing uh, for interference with other vaccines, and the site populations throughout Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, but the thing that's most interesting uh, to me, I guess from a statistical perspective, is the, uh, are, are the trial endpoints. Of course, there are no clinical endpoints in sight, these are all uh, biomarkers of various states of val invalidation. Um, uh, and really what is going to come out of this is a, uh, a profile across these many different characteristics that we require from, from uh, uh, vaccine regimens for, for end game. So there are the standard uh, uh, humoral immunity endpoints, the antibodies, there are nine endpoints, basically three, three serotypes, cross, take, seroprotection levels, and antibody titers. Um, gut immunity endpoints, which are really just shedding, uh, the kinetics of viral shedding following an M, a monovalent OPV2 challenge, which has been interesting. That's, uh, that was a new, uh, new endpoint that we devised for these studies. Genetic stability endpoints for the NOPV trials. Uh, involving deep sequencing of viruses that are shed in the stool across time, um, both for stability of some of the genetic modifications that are used to construct the vaccine strain, but also a little trickier uh, since there is a general mutational background, trying to identify mutations that seem to enhance the fitness of the virus in replicating in the gut and might be an indication of uh, something that we wouldn't want to, uh, to be out in the environment. Um, so that gets, that start, the interpretation of that endpoint starts to get pretty tricky. Um, there's really no good way to test the neurovirulence phenotype, but it's absolutely critical. So there's a transgenic mouse model that will test uh, using isolates from stool, uh, both for um, the PD-50, um, it's a titration type of assay using you know, eight to 10 mice at each of probably six doses, but also a tolerance level to, uh, to try and bound the frequency of highly virulent isolates that might be emerging. And then there are some transmission studies that are being done in, in Asia, individual and village randomized trials, tricky design, uh, where uh, some of the endpoints will be environmental monitoring uh, for, uh, for environmental load, sero status, cross-vaccination status in, in individuals, uh, and, and so on. So 
these are some of the features. Uh, I'm obviously in this time not going to go into much detail, but gives you just a sense of what the program looks like in size and shape and, and what the issues are. I think I'll, in the interest of time, skip this slide. Uh, and get to the last two slides, which is, you know, I think these technical issues of developing the vaccines and evaluating them and rolling them out are, you know, they're not trivial, but I, I think we actually have them pretty well in hand. The, the foundation has uh, assembled a team, has resourced it, has a process where th this is going, you know, like gangbusters. And, I, and it, it's been uh, part way in an extraordinarily successful program. The real make or break for eradication is going to be in the field. Uh, so this is a, a slide uh, from uh, India um, back when the eradication effort uh, in India was in full swing. There was a, a heavy monsoon season and uh, uh, flooding and bridges to an island went out. Um, and this is uh, this fellow wading across the river carrying the, um, uh, the insulated package with the vaccines. This is actually Ananda. He now works at the Gates Foundation, runs this program. He's a terrific guy. I work closely with him. Uh, and um, uh, due to this kind of effort in the field, um, uh, India has been polio-free since 2011, 2014, certified, eradicated. Which brings us to the problem currently. So back in, I think, 2011 or 12, when uh, it was learned that vaccine workers, not polio vaccine workers, uh, but vaccine workers in the Middle East were being used by the CIA to collect intelligence to try and find out where bin Laden was, um, that was really a bad idea. And so when that came out, uh, uh, the uh, Islamic the Taliban, basically, and Boko Haram in, in Nigeria decided that they were going to have no more of that. So they started killing polio workers. And you can see from the, from the map here, this is a map of uh, Pakistan from 2011 to 2014, a case map. Um, we actually, you know, kind of had it on the run in, uh, in Pakistan uh, in 2012. And then you can see the uh, cases starting to appear up in that little line on the border with, uh, uh, oh, this is Afghanistan, I guess. Uh, no, this is Pakistan, on the border with Afghanistan. And this is exactly where uh, the problem is. So uh, since 2012, more than uh, 60 polio workers trying to get up in that region have been, uh, have been killed. Uh, current estimates are that there are about a half a million children in that region that have uh, not uh, been immunized and should be. Um, and this problem has been worked uh, in non-academic ways uh, that are kind of difficult to report. But there is some hope. Uh, if you look at uh, the first quarter of this year, uh, there are about 20 cases that have been uh, reported uh, from this, uh, uh, from these actually uh, both Pakistan and Afghanistan. And that is about half the number that was reported uh, in the same quarter uh, in 2014. So I think progress is being made. I think there's still hope that we can do this. But uh, what happens on the ground, I think, is going to be key, probably more than the, the technical issues that uh, we'll have to deal with in the, in the science. So I want to uh, thank the Gates Foundation uh, and some of the folks that we've been uh, working with on this problem. They've just been uh, terrific. But the real appreciation uh, now, now comes for, uh, uh, for Chuck. Um, when I went back to, uh, uh, to Seattle, a couple years after I was back, um, I, uh, I had a conversation with my, uh, with my father. And it was, uh, it was in about 86, two years after I'd come back, and it was about two years before he died. And, you know, he was kind of a gruff guy and, you know, didn't communicate very well. And, but he told me something. Um, he told me about a conversation that he had with Chuck in uh, 1981, just a short conversation. I'm sure Chuck would not remember it. Um, but um, it's one that uh, I think um, the 
that I found out about and I've had in my mind for all of these years. And so I want to tell you that story. Um, I need to uh, digress a little bit uh, to tell you about my dad to kind of set this conversation up. Um, so my dad came of age in the Depression and uh, had a tough time. Uh, he uh, graduated from high school, that was it. And um, uh, he kind of uh, kicked around until World War II and went in the Army and served in the Pacific Theater, came back, um, you know, true to form, wouldn't talk about it. Uh, and got a job uh, with the Southern Pacific Railroad, worked there for 35 years, uh, retired, and um, uh, moved up to Seattle just as I was leaving, uh, uh, moving to Baltimore. Now with that background, he was very proud when I went to college. But when I decided to go to graduate school, um, it was a little bit different story. He couldn't decide whether I was just being lazy or I'd kind of lost my mind. And uh, it only got worse when I got a PhD in biostatistics and then in 81 decided to move to Baltimore to take a job at Hopkins. And so uh, we moved out here. Uh, my first son, Patrick, was, was, uh, was one. And uh, my mom and dad made the obligatory trip to Baltimore uh, in 81 just to see you know, what kind of uh, mess I'd gotten us all into. <laughs> Very skeptical. Um, so um, they came and visited. And uh, in 86, you know, I was talking about this uh, with my dad. And he said that, you know, when he got here, he was sort of back on his heels. He didn't really understand all of this and was really quite concerned. And he said that um, uh, Chuck must have recognized that in him because he said he took him aside and just in a couple minutes said, it's going to be okay. You know, this is where he belongs. He'll be, you know, he'll be okay here. You know, it'll all be fine. And, you know, it's amazing that my dad would remember that and would communicate it to me in a way that he said that just meant the world to me. And so immediately that meant the world to me. So, um, this is the characteristic that I think of most about Chuck. He can identify when somebody needs something in a really quiet and unassuming way, he can deliver that, make it right. Now, I would have never known this had I not had the conversation in 86 with my dad. And it was uh, really a, um, I wouldn't have expected to have that kind of a conversation with him anyway. And so it made me think about, as I was listening to all these uh, people uh, this morning and, and, and this afternoon, think about all of the things that Chuck has done along those lines. Many, you know, some of which we can report because we actually know about them, but probably most of which we will never know. And that's the thing that um, uh, I appreciate the most about Chuck. 